All right. Well, good morning, Compass. Good to see so many folks. A lot, bunch of you got the got the news and wore a shirt, right? A jersey or whatever for your team. How many college teams do we have? Get our hand raised. College teams. How many professional teams do we have? Right? How many how many are wearing the jersey of the people of your house? Right here. Like you're wearing regular, normal clothes. All right, that's good. That's good. That works. Uh, hey, when you wear clothes of the jersey of like your favorite team, like it brings one of two big reactions. Like either everybody's like, oh, yeah, yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, me too, you know? Or, or it brings the reaction of, boo, right? And I just think, like, what could I possibly wear out of the house today and just people see me and just go, boo, like total stranger, boo. And, uh, and it's kind of like what it's like. I think if we, uh, if we think about uh, being the away team this morning, we're going to continue in our series on this. Uh, it, it's sort of like we wear a jersey that identifies us with a team that's not the home team, not the favorite team. And, uh, and you might get some people who like, hey, wow, me too. That's awesome. Or you might get some other folks who like instantly are kind of like boo you know and and that's what we're saying as Christians living in our culture uh, we're supposed to be distinctive and different but but also we're in a culture that increasingly is less interested in, in things of Jesus increasingly less interested in the church and maybe even go a step further increasingly uh, uh, sort of uh, antagonistic towards the church maybe to use another analogy um this morning, and maybe a different way to kind of picture all this. Uh, I went to a steakhouse here recently, and I, we don't do that a lot. We, we go once in a while. Somebody was really excited about that, and that's cool. Um, honestly, I kind of go more, more than just for the steak. I go for those free rolls, a.k.a. the donuts with the cinnamon butter. You know what I'm talking about? That they come out, and they just keep bringing them. Has anybody ever reached the limit, like where they said, I'm sorry, we can't bring you anymore? Like, I'm still trying to test that limit. And find out how many I can possibly have. It's not good for me. So that's why we don't go very often. But we went to the steakhouse. Anybody else like, uh, like eating like steak? You just grilled meat. Like that's what I want. Okay. All right. Good. All right. So it got me thinking. Have you ever tried to invite a vegetarian to go with you? Okay. All right. Like you invite a vegetarian. What's the, what's the appeal there? Like what's the pitch? Hey, come to a steakhouse with me. You can have lots of good vegetables, right? Or like you can have potatoes with butter and cream and bacon. It's just like it just doesn't work. I think the, the sales pitch is a little tough to, to get somebody who's a vegetarian to come to a steakhouse, but that is the mission, friends, right? Our mission as Christians is to make disciples of Jesus among a culture who by and large have no appetite for a relationship with Jesus, right? Now, now don't make any mistake. People want a better life, Right? People want a blessed life. People want a, a happier marriage. They want to be more joyful in their parenting. Right? They want, to, they want to see their lives be more successful. Does God have a part in that? Maybe. Does the church have a part in that? Definitely not. Right? That's kind of our culture. And sharing your faith as Christians as a counterculture, I think, is just like trying to convince vegetarians to eat steak. Like, how do you get uh, somebody who's a vegetarian even in the door of a steakhouse? How do you get them to taste a piece of beef that hasn't been cooked past its death, resurrection, and second death? Or as some of you call it, well done. <laughs> right? Maybe, maybe most of you, here, here's the thing. I think the better analogy, maybe most of you already love meat, right? Maybe you already, maybe there's very few vegetarians or vegans in, in the room or whatever. So maybe the better analogy is kind of put the shoe on the other foot. What if... We considered ourselves, right, most, most people, you already love meat, you already love steak, you already love it medium rare, the way God intended, and, and so the, the, um, the difficult thing is to imagine how would, we get, how would we get a whole culture of meat eaters to become vegetarians? Maybe that's the way to look at it. You know, how, how, can we get, how do we get these Christians, right, uh, who are like the, essentially the world's vegans, right, how do we get that to become more appealing to a culture that just loves consuming, you know, animal products. Well, how would we do that? I guess one way that we could approach that is we start making a lot of plant-based material that tastes exactly like meat, right? Plant-based material that looks and tastes kind of like burgers or turkey or bacon, right? And we'd, we'll, we would call that impossible, right? This is very close to home, isn't it? Uh, but here, but let me ask you a question. Is it working, Right? Is it working? How many of you meat eaters, right? Like last year at Thanksgiving, you ate a tofurkey and some cauliflower stuffing. You said, that's it. I'm on board, right? I am joining the vegan train because this is exciting, all right? I, I don't know anybody that's being convinced by this artificial 
sort of fake meat, like that that's somehow enticing. And, and listen, this is kind of what I think the church has done. Christians have a reputation, right, in our culture, and it's not one of making Jesus or the gospel appealing. Instead, we look like and sound like and talk like exactly like all the people around us. We just kind of take a different spin on it, right? This is what Christianity looks like. I think we try to convince a culture around us to believe what we believe when all we've really done is take the exact same complaining, the exact same social posturing, The exact same conversation, we just repackage them, right, from our view of the political or social or economic issue of the day. Now, Christians, listen, as a church, we don't have to lose hope. It looks like we're losing hope. Maybe you feel like you've lost it. But but here's what happens. When we start to lose hope, we start to convey this attitude of fear, this attitude of frustration. Every time there's changes in our society and and changes in our laws, and so we make all these desperate attempts to sort of prolong what what seems to be the inevitable decline of the church in the Western society. And during all of that, as we're trying to posture, the world is watching how we're doing that, and they're watching our sort of imitation arguments, and they're, they're seeing what we say, hearing what we say, and seeing what we post, sorry. And, and, and they're, they're watching and witnessing as we just grumble and complain, and, and whether it's culture wars or, or trying to maintain some kind of power or influence or some recognition. And, and, and listen, the church has become more known for what we're against than what we're for. We're, we're known for standing opposed to a whole lot of what our culture embraces. And yet, you watch the way we live, and we live just like that culture. And somehow we're surprised when the culture around us accuses Christians in the church of being phony. As if so many of us who, who say we, we aren't like in agreement with the world around us just live like we're in love with the world around us. And far too often we're very happy as long as our churches are prospering, as long as Christians have a seat at the cultural or political table, and, 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 and suddenly... We wind up, instead of inviting other people and other races and other creeds and other lifestyles around our own kitchen table, instead we just keep people at arm's length, and somehow we've come and arrived at this place where we are somehow of the world, but not in the world. We look just like the world, but we don't have any interest in changing it. How did that happen? See, so often I think Christian uh, evangelicals in America, we, we become sort of hopeless and, and disappointed and complaining, specifically in light of our fading cultural power and influence. And so our knee-jerk reaction is to complain and, and cry about what's been lost, throw up our arms in, in the air and call foul. And as we continue to lose ground... We're fighting for our rights in the public square. We're slamming our opponents on social media. We're fearful about the future. And I don't think it's fear that's the problem. Even though we seem fearful, I think the problem is that we're not fearful enough. We're fearing the wrong thing. We're not fearful or concerned or exasperated about the certain and dreadful end for our unbelieving neighbors. We are not certain and and fearful about a God who will stand in judgment of every one of us. We've grown fearful of the culture around us instead of the God we we claim to serve. And here's the thing. First Peter was written to people facing a very similar social situation as we have. Right? Christians in the first century were living in a culture that didn't embrace God, that didn't have anything to do, didn't know Jesus, didn't embrace godly values, stood increasingly more and more opposed to the church. And Peter writes to them how they can be an influence. And guess what? Whatever it is, it worked. Because our world changed, right? Over time, those Christians in the first century grew and grew and grew and gained influence and ultimately changed the world. You and I are products of that. The good news of Jesus spread to the western part of the world because they were faithful and they changed culture around them. How did they do it? Well, it wasn't political, right? They didn't. 
They didn't vote somebody new into office. They didn't even have social media, right? How did they do it? How were they successful? I believe it's because they took to heart what Peter says to them and what I believe he says to you and me in a time just like that. That Man, Christian friends, if, if you and I will just embrace this and do this again, we will change the world again. It's totally in our grasp. It's totally an opportunity before you and me. Look, look what he says in 1 Peter chapter 3, starting in verse 14. This is what he says. Who's going to harm you if you're eager to do good? But even if you should suffer for what is right, you're blessed. Do not fear what they fear. Do not be frightened. All right, I think it speaks to us as Christians. It speaks to this issue of fear. Or, or maybe the right thing, the placement of our fear. Where our fear is placed. What exactly we're fearing. Now this specific passage from Peter is a reference to Isaiah chapter 8. All the way back in in the, gospel, or in the uh, prophet Isaiah, God is speaking to a people that are getting ready to be oppressed. His chosen people are getting ready to be dominated by their enemies. They're going to be handed over to a hardened culture. And this is going to be a very difficult message for them to hear. And Peter sort of harkens back to that, reminding these early Christians, listen, don't be afraid of the consequences you may suffer in the short run. Don't be afraid of the persecution you may suffer for being a follower of Christ. You, you may fear losing your house. You may fear losing your job or your reputation. They may have even feared you know, physical harm or, or even death and imprisonment. And we experience some of those things in our culture. I think the fears, though, how, that, that we really face as Christians in our culture are less about uh, losing jobs or, or losing our life or, or experiencing physical persecution, but rather we fear ridicule. We fear rejection. We fear maybe what we don't know about the Bible or, or maybe to a lesser degree, you know, we fear some sort of consequence in losing our social standing. But I believe, as L.A. Clark writes, that the greatest hindrance to sharing your faith to evangelism, is fear, or more accurately, the lack of fear, the lack of appropriate fear. This is the way Jesus said it in Matthew chapter 10, verse 28. He said, don't be afraid of those who can kill the body and cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both the body and the soul in hell. In other words, fear God. Most Christians would identify fear, most you and I, but I'd ask, hey, why didn't we share our faith a little bit more than we do? Most of us would say it's fear. But maybe the more accurate word is shame. We're afraid of what other people may think of us. And we're afraid as we share our faith that we might lose some social standing with a friend or a neighbor. We might make our family conversation or our holiday get-togethers awkward. And so we've just learned to sort of not talk about those things, right? You might even have somebody you really genuinely care about and that you want to see them come to faith, but you just don't bring up matters of faith because you don't want to disrupt, sort of the, shake the apple cart. You don't want to rock the boat and make things awkward. And so you'll put that off year after year after year, having a serious conversation about what they believe about Jesus and what you believe about Jesus. But I think the result is that all of our efforts as Christians in evangelism have moved out of the one-on-one -on -one interpersonal relationships we have. And instead, we've become, we've become content to just let other people do it. And what's really absent is the fear of God. See, I think we've come to believe that the most effective way to, to, to share Jesus is to be positive and encouraging, right? Have that good music on the radio. We assume the way to win the masses is by rebranding our church to offer a better life, better marriage, better finances. The greatest apologists, right, the people who can articulate the faith, the, our, our faith the best, are successful CEOs, professional athletes, you know, celebrities who claim affiliation with Jesus, guys who, 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 who kneel or, or point to the sky in the end zone. Those are the people who can really influence a culture for Jesus, but not me. 
And so as a result, our gospel has become one-dimensional, and it's all about accessing blessing without the need to deal with any judgment. But in the book of Acts, in chapter 9, and in several places, the early church thrived when the Bible says that they feared the Lord. They grew and flourished as a church because they lived in fear of the Lord. Their fear was correctly placed. See, I think we fear people too much, and we don't fear God enough. And that's what leads us to not sharing our faith, not influencing the culture around us effectively. See, fearing others more than God demonstrates that I'm trying to please them more than God. You you will try to please the one you fear the most. Go with me here, because this is so key in our concept. You know you fear somebody when you desire their approval and live for their praise. And far too often, the problem with with Christians is that we are afraid of what other people will say. We want other people's approval. But we're not nearly concerned enough with the approval of the God we love. And so we're committed to keeping people happy and having people like us. And in our culture, we want to be perceived as smart and contemporary and hip and tolerant and progressive and fun and woke and approving. And the list goes on. We just want other people to think well of us. We want to please them. We want them to approve of us. And meanwhile, what if God's, what if God's wanting us to do something different? We just don't seem to really want to please him. We're not really seeking after his approval. And so we'll nurture relationships with people in our life that don't know Jesus for years and years and years, trying to become good friends and never broaching the subject of Jesus. Why? Because we want to please them. We want them to like us. Now, what is appropriate Christian fear? Well, we're not supposed to be terrified, right? We're not supposed to be known as people who are just afraid and alarmed. According to Peter, we shouldn't tremble in fear at the thought of losing influence or losing standing or having a a school board decision go the wrong way or a Supreme Court decision that, that changes the culture around us. If that's what we're afraid of, if that's really what we spend the most time talking about, we're preaching the wrong gospel. We're telling people that our greatest fear is the loss of money or power or influence in this life. Instead of saying our greatest fear is that we or they might enter eternity without Jesus. And if we're not preaching the real gospel, we're preaching a gospel that looks exactly like the culture around us, which is why it's not any gospel at all, which is why we're not influencing the culture around us, because we don't look any different. We're just trying to win a political or a social war or an economic war. Well, that's no different from anybody else. See, in a world teeming with reasons to be terrified, Peter writes to these early Christians and says, the only thing you need to be afraid of is the Lord. Fear the Lord. Consider our heart disposition in speaking to our neighbors and our friends about Jesus with this distinction in mind. We're supposed to fear God, not people. If that was true of you and me, how would it change how we interact with the world around us? that was really true. If our primary aim was to please God and seek his approval instead of other people, how would we act differently? See, it's that fear of God, along with an appropriate fear of the coming judgment, that is a compelling motivation for you and me to open our mouth when it comes to sharing the gospel with somebody else. Because when we don't open our mouths with arrogant condescension or brimstone and fire or judgment. And when we don't open our mouths with complaint and worry and whining, and instead we open our mouths and declare the truth, listen, God is sovereign, he is good, and I want you to know him. Then we're honoring God, and we wind up honoring other people. This is what Peter says. Listen, don't fear what other people fear. You're different. Instead, 
Don't be frightened. And this is what he says in verse 15. In your hearts, set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. All right, so what, what's he saying? There's some language here that maybe we don't use all the time. What does it mean to, let's just start with this. Set a, apart Christ as Lord in our hearts. What does that mean? What does that look like? I believe it means that Jesus should have his own place in our hearts, no competition. He's in a category all by himself. John Piper says, in regards to him, we regard him as the holiest being in the universe. We regard him as unique, one of a kind, without peer or rival, in purity and rectitude and goodness. And when the the Bible says, set apart Christ as Lord, I think it means put him in a category by himself, the highest place, the greatest value, the most supreme treasure, the greatest admiration, the most cherished prize, the one you esteem and honor and love the most above all other persons and things in this world. And when we do that, then we're standing in awe of the lordship of God, right? We're bowing to his sovereign rule. We recognize that he is the one who's who's responsible for everything existing and and continuing to have life. Honoring God in that kind of way is setting Jesus apart as Lord. It's, It's the appropriate action or outcome when we truly fear the only thing we're called in Scripture to fear, which is God himself. It's a reverent fear. This is the natural way that we'll live. Now, If we do that, if we live for that audience of one, if we live in a way that only his evaluation of us matters, then people are going to ask us, what makes us so different? The message paraphrase says this verse this way. It says, be ready to speak up and tell anyone who asks you why you're living the way you are. And always with the utmost courtesy. See, The scripture here assumes that we're living in such a way that people would actually want to know what makes us different. And when people don't ask us what makes us different, it might be a clue that we are no different than people who don't believe in Jesus. And that ought to be a red flag. I went to a conference a few years ago. Uh, It was was a conference of, of preachers and church planters, okay? And and one of the things that they asked, the speaker that day asked, he said, is there anything about your life that is questionable? Or do we just go to the same places, order the same latte and biscuit to use the free Wi-Fi as anybody else, right? Do we, we show up and spend money at the same stores on the same merchandise as everybody else? Do we speak with the same language and the same tone as everybody else in our world? If so, nobody's ever going to ask you a question about your life. And this is what he said to us, and I thought it was awesome. He said, live a questionable life. And I love the double meaning, right? Live a questionable life. It ought to be weird. It ought to be peculiar. The way that we live ought to be so different that people can't help but say, what is up with you? Because when you set apart Christ as Lord and you decide that my life exists to serve and please him, this verse assumes that living that way, other people will will ask you, why are you living this way? Why are you not doing what everybody else is doing? Your life will beg for questions. Because you will have a joy that they don't have. You will have a response to adversity and grief that people don't have. You won't be throwing your hands up and complaining when the economy tanks. You won't be yelling at your TV screen when somebody says something you disagree with. See, Peter assumes that we're going to live in a way that so defies the cultural norms around us that people are just going to say, What is up with you? And then we're supposed to be prepared to give an answer for the reason of the hope that we have in Jesus. See, I think a lot of people, if you've read this verse before, and if you've been a Christian a long time, you've probably heard this verse before. A lot of times we use it as as sort of the rationale is, go educate yourself on how to explain the gospel, the content, right? 
you need enough Bible knowledge so that you're ready to answer Bible questions. You're ready to sort of describe your faith. And I'm not saying that there's not some content there. I mean, we need to be able to explain the gospel. Hey, I'm different because I believe in Jesus. Jesus lived a sinless life. Sin separates us from God, and he's the only way that we can kind of reconnect with God. God provided a way for us to be reconciled to him. So when Jesus died on the cross, he, he canceled out my debt of sin. God doesn't force me to love him, but because I choose to follow Jesus, he has given me, he's gifted me, he's given me this grace, this good gift that I didn't deserve of righteousness that belonged to Jesus. And Jesus traded places with me. I, I deserve a penalty, but he took it. And there's content there. You have to share content. But nobody wants to hear your content if your life's not any different. If you're not living a distinctive way, if there's nothing questionable about it. You don't have to defend a life that looks exactly like everybody else's. And so, listen, he, he's calling us to... To be distinctive enough that people will ask. And then he says in verse 16, do it with gentleness and respect. Some of you need to underline that today. Gentleness and respect. Gentleness and respect. This would change the way you interact with people. Okay? You think this would improve the reputation of Christians in America if everything we said and did to represent Jesus was done with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against our good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. It will be so obvious that there is no truth in the false accusations made against us that the world will notice and say, you know what, these guys are genuine. We need to know what's up. Now understand, gentleness and respect is the characteristic of how we respond to people when, when they start being curious about what makes us different. And I guess I just need to say this because, man, I, I, maybe I'm not saying it to any of you. I'm just saying it to, to the church in America. Evangelism is not a debate to be won. God has not called us to win arguments. He's called us to win people. We're supposed to win people, not arguments. And I think too often, Christians are out there trying to win arguments. We're just trying to posture. We're trying to convince people. You don't have to convince people when your life proves it. You just get to explain it. This is what I liken it to, right? Because there's, listen, I think that this is the perception of Christians and the church in our culture. Is that we're just... We're scared of everything. We're scared of losing our position. We're scared of laws being changed. We're scared of, of social issues turning, right? Or, and we're posting about that. We're posting about, oh, prophecy, you know, every, something just changed, and this is the fulfillment. It's the end of time. We're, for, you know, we're afraid, and, and it's just this alarming call from Christians. Like, we're just, everything is like, as in a, it's an emergency for us, and yet people who don't share our faith don't see it as an emergency at all. And I think it's just like car alarms. You remember car alarms in the 80s? It came out, right, late 80s, early 90s. Like, and it didn't matter what kind of car you had. You could have a, a total piece of junk. But you would go out and you'd spend the couple hundred bucks and you'd install this car alarm so that you could walk away from your car and go, bloop, bloop, you know, and that made you a person of status. I got something to protect here, right? And you walk into the place and it's like, bloop, bloop. You're like, I'm, I'm important. And then, you know, it wasn't enough just to have the car, like, honk repeatedly. Like, no, now that there's, like, there's, like, viper, you know, let's put a, put a snake around your car. And it wasn't really a snake. That would have been scary. No, instead, it made your car, like, make all these weird, bizarre noises. It was like your car was, like, calling in dial-up internet or something really loud on a loudspeaker. <laughs> you know, whatever noises it was going to make. And, and that was, like, the thing. And, and everybody thought it was really cool for, like, a minute. But what happens now, right? Car alarms are just an annoyance. They're just a bother. Like, the other day, I, my, my, my horn started honking, and I was like, oh, no, no, no. And, and I went out, and I was like, I must have hit the panic button or something. And, and I finally had to go out there, and, and, and I got it to stop, and I, I got the car to, to, to be quiet and everything. But much to my surprise, nobody had called the police, Right? Nobody came out to see if it was broken into. They certainly didn't assume that someone like me was in a panic. 
right? Because, why? Because car alarms are just annoying. If a car alarm went off right now, we heard it from in here, you and I would all have one of the same two reactions. The first thought would be, is that mine? You know, and then the second would be, somebody needs to turn that thing off. (laughs) And that's what people hear when they hear Christians complaining. It's an annoying car alarm. Christians pointing out, prophecy's being fulfilled. It's just an annoying noise to our culture. Because they've come to know that there's nothing true and of substance behind it. There's nothing worth trying to pursue there. And see, as freedoms slip away, as our culture sort of gets further and further away from God, what, listen, I'm going to, some of you are going to get mad, that's fine, you can send me an email, okay? What if God is taking away our influence in culture so that he can position us to actually be light in the darkness? To start influencing the culture again. To not just be pointless annoyances. Blaring, loud, obnoxious, that everybody just wishes would be quiet. And instead, he's, he's, he's getting our culture to be so far away from the values of God that when people actually see genuine believers of Jesus living out those values, they will be so distinctive that people will want to know What do you have that I don't? Friends, we have an amazing opportunity before us. See, I think Peter is saying that the most effective way that we can share our faith as a member of the away team in our culture is to live distinctive, questionable lives. And evangelism is not just some activity, like some large event, right? We'll invite our friends to, to church, right? That's... That's where you share Jesus. You have to have power and influence to share Jesus, right? You've got to be a celebrity or you've got to have a platform. You've got to have a voice. You've got to have a willing audience. And so that's why so many of us to this day, we think that the most effective spokespeople for Christianity are profile, high profile like celebrities and athletes and those kind of people, people of significance. And if they speak for Jesus, then the masses will listen. But we've seen it enough. We know that that's not true. The most effective representation of Jesus, according to the scripture, is you and me, one-on-one, sharing our life and our hope with another person. And it will never be another way. That will always be the most effective way of influencing and changing the culture around us. Which takes a lot of pressure off, doesn't it? It's not the way it's always been, right? Right? But I think, that, I think that if we embrace our identity as strangers, as foreigners, as sojourners in our culture, we're living in uncomfortable, less than desirable conditions. We've had our rights and our privileges swept, swept away from us. Right? We, we're not people of influence. We don't command a, a, a voice. We're forced to endure unpleasant situations Or live in relationships we never would have chosen. What if God's providence has led us to such a time as this. That we would be perfectly positioned to reach people who are far from him. God's done this over and over again. He did with Esther in the Old Testament. You know, this very small remnant of Jewish people living under Persian control. And ultimately she was put in that position a concubine to the king so that she could influence him to honor God's people and to save them from destruction. I got friends who work in Muslim countries as missionaries and they introduce people to Jesus, oftentimes with great risk. And oftentimes one family member will come to faith before the rest of their family or any of their other friends and the result is that that one person feels kind of alone. Oftentimes, maybe it's one spouse comes to faith and the other spouse is not a believer. And we'll call her Aisha. This one woman became a believer, but her husband was still a devout Muslim. A friend of mine was trying to help 
Aisha win her husband to Jesus, but she was afraid, right? Because he still had connections to extremist groups and let alone just the, the ostracization that she would have felt and how isolated she would have been if her husband had sort of found out about this conversion and turned on her. And so how, how does she live this way? How does she live without just constantly feeling alone? And how does she live as the only Christian in her household? And, and she was at a loss for how she could win her husband to the faith. But they came to First Peter, and they read, and it, and, and it was less about the content than it was about how she lives, right? Because how she lives was ultimately going to provide her the opportunity to share content with her unbelieving husband and family members. And it's interesting, when Peter composed this letter to those Christians suffering in the first century, I'm sure he had people in mind, women even, exactly like Aisha, where his concern was, your position seems weak and isolated, And he encourages them to relate to their unbelieving husbands, not by fighting, not by being combative, but with humility and gentleness. And the goal, no question, was their husband's salvation. And as such, his instruction to these women provides a perfect case study for you and for me on how we're supposed to live, how evangelism works when you are in a culture surrounded by people that don't embrace what you embrace. Right? I want you to see what Peter says just before this passage we've been reading, right? At the very beginning of chapter 3. At the end of chapter 2, he tells, hey, hey, if you're a slave, we want you to obey your masters. Not because slavery is right, but because you've got an opportunity to, inter- uh, uh, to introduce them to Jesus. And then he says in the same way, right? Wives, verse 1 in chapter 3, in the same way, wives must be... Uh, must accept the authority of your husbands that even if some refuse to obey the good news, your godly lives will speak to them without any words and they'll be won over by observing your pure and reverent lives. And so what's Peter saying? Well, Hang with me for a second because what he's going to say to wives specifically, I believe applies to all of us in general, but what is he saying specifically to wives? Listen, respect your husbands. If they don't believe in Jesus yet and you do, If you live in a distinctive way and you love them in a way that nobody else's wives are loving them, you show them a humility and a respect that nobody else is showing, you have this gentle and quiet spirit, suddenly they're going to start to wonder, what's what's gotten into you, right? What's making you different? And Peter understood that their respectful disposition was of even more importance than just saying something so effectual that their husbands would be brought to faith mainly just because they were watching how their wives were living and consistent with this new set of values that they had because they were following Jesus. Now, especially in the case of first-generation Christians, right, it can always be difficult to live in the same four walls as people who oppose the gospel, who don't share what you believe, and I, I'm sympathetic and empathetic to anybody in this room today or anybody watching online who's single in the faith, right? You, you believe in Jesus, but your spouse is not on the same page. I get it. But you can use your influence rather than to manipulate or whine or shame or provoke or exclude or intimidate, you can use your influence to honor and respect Those are your two choices. And Peter says, you choose the latter because that will lead them to faith in Jesus. Now, I don't think Peter is just talking to slaves or to people with authority over them. He's not just talking to employees who are trying to win over their non-Christian boss. And I don't think he's just talking to wives who have unbelieving husbands or even husbands who have unbelieving wives, kids who have unbelieving parents. I think he's talking to all Christians. Listen, if you will live in a way that evokes humility and gentleness and kindness and patience and dignity, people will ask, what is going on with you? Even us, as we live as strangers and aliens in the world, I believe he will position us to be light in the darkness, to be a distinct group of people set apart for Christ. And that's what people will be drawn to. That's why people will come to faith. Heather Dickens started coming to our church in 2019 and um, 
she was exploring you know, where she was at in her faith, and, and sometimes her family joined her. But that fall, she decided that she was going to follow Jesus in baptism. It was August 2019. And, and what I thought was really great was that uh, they had three kids, but, but her husband, Ben, and their oldest son, Parker, watched for the next several weeks to just see, is this genuine? Right? Is this real? What have they done to our mother? You know, I was like, what? And a few months later, in December of 2019, Ben and Parker also decided to follow Jesus in baptism. And I think this is what happens. Some of you are waiting for your spouse, your kids, your family members to come to the same place as you are in faith. When God is telling you, no, you step forward and you do it with gentleness and you do it with humility and you serve the Lord and they can't help but ask, is this real? And when they see that it is, they'll follow. Humility and gentleness are not just appropriate behavior for women in a patriarchal society. Gentleness and humility and respect is supposed to characterize every one of us Christians living everywhere because we're supposed to honor everyone, especially people who don't share our faith or values. Listen, we are not called to protest and fight and argue to win an argument. We are called to live for Jesus and stand out in a way that makes the gospel appealing. And when we do that, people will ask. And if they're not asking, we're not doing it. This is not about being a doormat, right? Let me just offer this caveat. You know, if you're in a household and there's some domineering, abusive spouse, a person in your household, I don't think that you just let that go unchecked. I, I, I think you need to be assertive. I think you need to get some help. And it's not about going to work every day for some, you know, rude, awful, you know, domineering boss without, you know, maybe changing jobs or whatever. I, that, that's not the point. The point is not that we lay down and let people walk all over us. The point is that we would be distinctive and different, that we would be foreigners, that we'd stand out like a sore thumb in our culture, that we would be an unusually great wife, an unusually great husband, an unusually helpful employee, an unusually kind neighbor, an unusually generous friend. It is about living in a way that is questionable. Living a questionable life so that makes Christ appealing to the atheist and irresistible to the skeptic. It's like enticing a vegetarian to taste steak for the very first time. And not just because it's got a good flavor, but because they see the unmistakable, undeniable change in your life because you eat it. As Peter says, you taste and see that the Lord is good and other people will see that in you. And then Peter kind of changes gears and talks a little bit about our motivation and at risk of being confusing or taking away from the main point that we need, to, we need to fear God more than we fear other people, and that we're called to live distinctive lives, not argue people into the kingdom. But the motivation, why are we doing any of this? It's because of Jesus. This is what Peter says. Chapter 3, verse uh, 16. Or, sorry, verse, ah, verse 18. For Christ died for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive by Christ. Two motivations for why we share our faith, okay? First of all, because God loves us. God loves you. And that ought to motivate you, right? If you've received grace and forgiveness and mercy, you've received salvation you didn't earn or deserve, it becomes your duty to share that, right? You don't keep that news to yourself. To do that's like a slap in the face of the one who died for you. It's our responsibility. Romans 5, 8 says that God demonstrates his own love for us, for you and for me. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We're, we're supposed to walk in his footsteps and go and show people love in the same way. And, and man, I've been privileged to know a lot of cancer survivors, and many of them will, will participate in, in all the charity events and the, the, the 5K runs and, and to wear all the stuff and to do the fundraisers. And you ask them why, and it, it's not because they love running, Right? Not because they go, love going around and, and asking people for money. No, it's because they sense this sense of obligation. You know what? I was cured. As one of the cured, I have an obligation to help. Listen, Christians, you, you're one of the cured. 
If you're a follower of Jesus, you've been forgiven of your sin. You've been given a new life. You have an obligation. You've been cured. You've been forgiven. You've been saved. When we put our trust in a perfect Savior who has cured us of our sin disease, we've got to tell other people how they can be cured too. But also, we're motivated not just because God loves us. We're motivated because God loves other people. God loves other people. In fact, he loves everybody equally. He doesn't love you or me more than he loves the homeless person or the exotic dancer or the the CEO, the atheist or the preacher. He loves all of us the same way. And, and, And he loves us and accepts us just how we are, but he loves us too much to let us stay that way. And so he wants the best for you. He wants the best for others. He wants to see people saved and come to eternal life in Jesus. And our motivation for sharing our faith then is because we start to see people the way that God sees people. He loves them and so we start to love them. And if you believe people are really lost apart from the Lord, and I can be honest, it's the height of selfishness to fail to point them to salvation. Because God's love is a love that communicates. It takes the first step. And I just can't, as a believer, fathom you being separated from God for all eternity. You know, I made several references, but we just just say what it is. We're talking about heaven and hell. We're talking about a real possibility that every human being is going to spend eternity somewhere and that hell is where people will spend eternity when they don't know Jesus. Some of you say, well, come on, uh, I don't know if I believe in that. I mean, I think hell is just sort of conjured up by preachers to guilt trip people into good behavior and attending church. Well, if Jesus didn't make any difference in our life, I would believe that argument. And I'll bet that's why a lot of people don't have any interest in church. Because they think that we're just manufacturing all this. But if they start to see a real difference in the way that we live, they'll start to know there's something behind it. Now listen, let's just clear the air and be clear about heaven and hell. If the Bible said that there was a real place called hell just one time, We would have to believe it and accept it. But the Bible does not speak about hell one time. The Bible mentions hell 54 times. And you know who spoke about it more than anybody else? Jesus. In fact, Jesus went to some incredible lengths to make sure that you and I would never have to see a place called hell. Understand, hell is... It's simply that place where people who didn't want God in their lives finally get what they wanted. Eternity without God. And how sad. Joe Aldridge once read, Remember, unbelievers are not the enemy. They are victims of the enemy. Our culture might not really be listening to our doctrine or our political discourse but they cannot ignore our unselfish love demonstrated through our faith in Jesus and so then he takes the next several verses and he talks about how Jesus essentially went to the depths of hell to save people he says in verse 19 that through whom he also went and preached to the spirits in prison what a confusing statement right right here at the end of a message I'm going to disconnect everybody even Martin Luther said you know this is a wonderful text this most obscure passage perhaps in any other place in the New Testament so much so that I don't even know for certainty what Peter is talking about and I agree with Martin Luther right it's, it's hard to explain like what in the world is, is this talking about Jesus went to preach to people in heaven all right well I don't know but here's three results that he clearly talks about as what happens when somebody comes to faith in Jesus he talks about our salvation. First Peter 3.20, God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built, and in it only a few people, eight in all, were saved through water. Right? God, God is on a rescue mission. He wants to save as many people as want to believe. And when you put your trust in Jesus, you are saved. But then he says a couple other things. And this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also. Not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a good conscience towards God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. What does it mean baptism saves you? Mike Graham was a leader at my home church, and he became a successful business person, and then eventually decided to leave that career and and entered the ministry. But pretty early in that ministry, he was called on a Sunday morning to, uh, to baptize a gentleman. And so he took the gentleman's confession, you know, I believe Jesus is the Christ, Son of the living God. 
my Lord and Savior. And because it was the first time he'd ever baptized anybody, he got a little confused. And he said, I now pronounce you baptized, right? And he baptized him, and he recovered well. He did okay, but uh, he, he didn't get asked to do a lot of baptisms after that. I, incidentally, he did pick up a lot of weddings, right? But if you think about it, what he said is not far off. Baptism, in a sense, is a wedding. The Bible says we are united with Jesus in baptism. We're united with him in his death so that we'll be united with him in a resurrection. What a moment of joy. And Peter says in this passage, baptism now saves you. It's not the removal of filth from the flesh. It's not like taking a bath. It's the pledge of a good conscience. Another translation says that this word it means it's the appeal of a good conscience. It's an ask. Baptism is where we request that, God, would you save me? It's not the water that's magical, it's your faith. Without faith and commitment to Jesus, baptism just makes you a soaked sinner. But when we humble ourselves in baptism, we're taking that first step into a life of humility. We're being obedient to what was commanded by the one that we're saying is our Lord. And if he commanded it, surely I can do it. Or as Leroy Lawson says, in baptism, you're presenting yourself as a candidate for God's forgiveness. And God meets you in the water and somehow puts you in contact with the blood of his son Jesus which cleanses you and washes you from all sin and the third thing that Peter says happens in verse 22 that Jesus has gone into heaven and is at God's right hand with angels, authorities and powers in submission to him listen friends Jesus has already won the victory our job is not to fight his battle our job is to live like him And to be ready to answer the question. Because when you live like Jesus, people are going to have questions. Somebody said, you know, there's a great quote out there, you know, preach the gospel, but if necessary, use words. It's like, you know what? You got to use words. You got to tell people about Jesus. But nobody's ever going to ask. If we're not living differently. Where are you in your life? What relationships are you in your life where you start showing an amazing amount of kindness, patience, humility, generosity? And those people who might be the hardest to reach in some people's minds, God will soften their hearts as they see you and me doing something different than the world around us. And they'll want to know what makes you different. Those of you who are already Christians, let me just say, listen, I get it. I've blown this a lot. I look like everybody else. I'm convicted when I read this passage. and As much as I've slipped away from God's standards, I want to recommit so that I'm living in a distinctive way. I think we can all improve on sharing the reason for the hope that we have in Jesus. Speaking up being less afraid of our position and our reputation with them or other people and more concerned and more afraid of what does God think and what happens to this person if they enter eternity without Jesus. But those of you who are not followers of Jesus yet, and I wonder how many people have tried to have that conversation with you, maybe stepped across that line just to try to influence you for Jesus, but they're so terribly afraid. And they've been praying you got family members, they've been praying for you. And they're just waiting for something to click with you that you would know Christ. Be saved from your sin for all eternity. I wonder if today's that day for you. Are you ready to take that step and say, I'm ready to follow him? Are you ready to step across that line of faith and say, I don't just believe in God, but I surrender, I'm going to make him the Lord of my life from this day forward. If that's your commitment, like we had somebody for service, make that decision and get baptized today. Maybe that's a decision you need to make too. Don't put it off. If you'd like to talk to somebody about that decision, we're going to have me and the team in the back. If you just need prayer today, we'll be back there to meet with you and pray with you. The band's going to lead us, and the rest of us are going to celebrate a time of communion. Communion is that opportunity for us to recognize, hey, Jesus died on our behalf, his body and his blood broken and shed for us I'm not worthy but I'm I'm going to renew my commitment to live for you to be distinctive so if you're already a follower of Jesus would you make your way to one of these tables in the front or in the back 
take that bread and that juice and renew your commitment to Jesus. Let me pray over us. Father, thank you for this challenge that the approach we take to try to change the culture around us, to influence it for good, and most importantly, to save people from hell. That the best approach we have is to live distinctly. So, Father, I pray that we would fear you above all else, that we would only fear you and nothing else. So that we'll not be afraid of what other people say when we stand up and live for you. That we won't wait to broach the subject of Jesus with our unbelieving relative or friend or neighbor. But God, that we don't have to be belligerent. We don't have to be argumentative. We don't have to lament the cultures changing all around us. That could be exactly what you're going to use to once again use your church to change the world. Would you use us right now, God, to change our families, our neighborhoods, our community? Would you use your church once again? That's, that's us. Would you use us to turn our world upside down so that other people would find and follow Jesus too? Starting with us, God, would you change our world for Christ. In Jesus' name.